Somebody <laughs> <laughs> a good phrase. <laughs> All right, guys. Let's flip back to Deuteronomy. Chapter 11. Kept the promise in chapter 10. We are in 11. Somebody tell me the names Dathan and Abiram in verse 6. Where is that coming from? What happened? They were involved with the Korah Rebellion. You guys remember that? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, those are Reubenites. Didn't something like that happen up in Tennessee? The Indians, real foot like? Have you ever been up there? Where it's sw- it's the up. story, yeah. yeah I mean, it's like, just, it, no, it's not for real, but it's the story behind it. The earth opened up. And Absolutely, yeah. Big fault line right there. So what um, was that verse, Fred? Excuse me. I, uh, I couldn't see where it was from. Verse 6, verse six Dathan and Abiram. Korah, the incident where the earth swallowed them up. Nathan and Abiram were the other two with him. They were the Reubenites. Verse 7, but your eyes have seen every great act of the Lord which he did. That is a bold statement. It is a truth statement. And it's something that, unfortunately, just a generation or two later, they're going to forget about. Um, Somebody tell me what did they do as soon as they crossed over the Jordan? What did they build? Erected the one on the 12 stone. Okay. And what was that to be? A memorial for where they had come from. Where they had been delivered. So when their kids asked them what's that for? They could tell. Right. Some folks have called those sin stones uh, or memorial stones or they go by all kinds of different names. One thing I would point out to you is those stones are still somewhere physically on this earth, so if matter doesn't is it created or destroyed. Be kind of neat if I had one. So if y'all want to give me a Christmas present, you can those stones. <laughs> Exodus three. Uh, look at, at 11, um, Deuteronomy chapter eleven, verse nine. And that you may prolong your days in the land which the Lord swore to give your fathers to them and their descendants, a land flowing with milk and honey. Um, in fact, if you look back at Exodus chapter 3, verse 8, that is precisely what we're finding going on there. Somebody read me that if you got it quickly. So I have come down to deliver them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them up from that land to a good and spacious land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanite and the Hittite and the, Amor- the Amorite and the Perizzite and the Hivite. Okay, so over and over again, what we're finding is, is Moses is drawing his words to a close. Is he's reminding him, look, God, God kept His promise. Here's what He said He was going to do, and here's what He's done. Verses 13 through 15. It shall be that if you earnestly obey My commandments, which I command you today, to love the Lord your God with, and serve Him with all your heart, with all your soul, then I will give you the rain for your land in its season: early rain, the later rain. You may gather in your grain, new wine, your oil, I will sing grass. So he's basically saying, what? If you obey me, what? Will they ever have to work for anything? I mean, as far as the way they did in Egypt. No. Guys, do you remember what they had to do in Egypt as far as agriculture and, and construction? They were making bricks. And we know that they had to carry water, plant their seeds. This is a land where he's basically saying, you're not going to even have to plant seeds. You're not going to have to water. I got it all under control. And back home, we, I, I plant a garden. What do you call stuff that comes up that you didn't plant that year? Weeds. Weeds. Volunteers. Volunteers. So, for instance, let's say you had some tomatoes that rotted, the birds got in, you threw them on, and then the, the seeds got in next year that you grow a tomato plant right there in that place. The point is, I didn't have to work for that. That's a volunteer. I didn't have to do anything for it. Did we study something about it? Is it that uh, the Jubilee, uh, 
the harvest yeah. every seven years so that all that would come up, and that's what they would live on, Absolutely. the volunteer. Exactly. So here he is saying, trying to get across to them, your, your fathers had to work in Egypt. I'm fixing to give you something. The rain is going to be perfect, which that's an interesting designation since we know there is a major account in God's word where rain is withheld. What's going on right there? They were worshiping idols. They were worshiping idols. And who, who, who did the withholding? Obviously God, but who said? Elijah. 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 Absolutely. All right. Verse 19. You shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. Have we heard that verse before? Uh, 6, 5, through 9. It's on my wall back home. The whole house is sharpie. In fact, I had a Jehovah Witness that look, he didn't mean write them on the wall, literally, and put them on your. And went to tell I got them on my wall. Yeah. Actually, my wife's got them on the postcard. Yeah, I use sharpie. <laughs> <laughs> Note to self, don't buy a house. Um, you should write them on the door of your house when you get Starting in verse 12, he prescribes them a place for worship. Look at verse 2. You shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations which you shall dispossess serve their gods on the high mountains, on the hills, under every green tree. What is he... What? This is hard for us to get our, our minds around. What is he saying about other religions? Not just their bad influence. What does he want you to do? Destroy. Destroy. Okay, now how do we look at that today through our sterilized American eyes? How many church buildings that are teaching false doctrine did you pass in the last week? You ever thought about that? The fact that God demands. He doesn't just ask for He is demanding for them to tear all this mess down. And yet every single day we're passing by places. We, and I mean these people in this room, we know they're teaching garbage. Mm -hmm. Get the sledgehammers. Get the sledgehammers. <laughs> Verse 8. You shall not do at all, or you shall not do at all do as we are doing here today. Every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes. That, that verse right there is going to come back to haunt them. Because how does the book of Kings end? Every man, every man was doing right, was doing what was right in their own eyes. So, it is the book of Kings. In it. Judges, Judges, Judges 17, 6. Yeah. It was before they go to the Kings. Right. So, at the end of the, the Judges stage, right before they put a, a king in place, everybody is doing right in his own eyes. Verse 11, then there will be a place where the Lord your God chooses to make his name. So, chapter 12, one of the things you need to kind of mentally take note of is finally God is going to have his place. It's not going to be this roving tabernacle. They're no longer going to be nomads. People are going to be settling down. They're going to be doing agriculture. So now we've got to have some revisions of the law to take into account the fact that they're nomadic, no longer nomadic and that there is going to be a place a prescribed place for worship. He revisits some of the uh, prescriptions about eating meats. I'm not going to touch on all of those other than to remind you they weren't allowed to mess with blood because life is in the blood. It's stated there again. For instance, in uh, Deuteronomy 12, verse 23, verse 16, only you shall not eat the blood, you shall pour it out on the earth like water. We go to the end of that chapter. Beware of false gods. When the Lord your God cuts off from before you the nations which you go to dispossess, you displace them and you dwell in their land. Take heed to yourself that you're not in stand to follow them after they are destroyed from before you. And that you do not inquire after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? I would do, like, do likewise. You should not worship the Lord your God in, 
in that way. Every abomination to the Lord which he hates, they have done to their gods. For they burn even their sons and daughters in the fire to their gods. Whatever I command you, be careful to observe it. You shall not add it or take away from it. What is, what's the essence? What's he getting at right here? Fire. Fire, okay. What was, what was the verse about making your children pass through the fire? Verse 31. Well, they burn even their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods. What fire was that? What no, God is that? No, no, no. And they were actually literally sacrificing their kids. They had a, a, a ritual where there would be loud singing, dancing, to try to drown out the screams of that child. Um, it was... I cannot fathom that. But apparently that's what they thought was good good and going on back then. All right. Verse 13, a lot, of, a lot of controversy about. If there arises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, he gives you a sign of wonder, and the sign of wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, Let us go after other gods which you have not known. Let us serve them. You should not listen to the words of the prophet or the dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God, fear him, keep his commandments. But the prophet, notice verse 5, or that dreamer of, or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death. Man, that sounds pretty cold, doesn't it? What do you think? Why do you think this was such a big deal? Ooh, sweet, we got a light bulb. Why do you think this was such a big deal? Well, it's to claim that you're speaking for God, and then you're not would be a major affront to him. Okay. Turn on people. Why, why though did he allow these people to do it? And the sentence them to death. Every dream that a dreamer had come from God? No. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. He's telling the people, if somebody says this, and something actually comes true, but he's trying to lead you away from God, what are you supposed to do to it? Kill him. So if he prophesies, the prophecy comes right, but you know ultimately what he is saying is against me and my law, what are you to do? You're to kill him. Now, let's first deal with the prophet. Right? Was the prophet or the dreamer good in the sight of God to begin with? I would suggest no. Absolutely not. In fact, I would say to you, what's going on here is you got somebody that God is using as a vessel to test the people. So, first thing you got to keep in mind is this guy is already bad. He's already sown his seeds to false prophecy. Now, let's let's talk about why in the world death. That's the death penalty. Tell me what we do in this country. If somebody murders somebody else, we lock them in a nice little free cell for the rest of their life. They get cable, they get workout room, they get three squares. <laughs> now, do we kill them? Sometimes Actually, the, uh, really. the sniper guys are going to be killed today. Maybe. That's true. Now, if you're in Texas, you do. You get shaken back. But most states, they don't, they don't do that. Now, you think with me for just a moment. We don't kill people who kill people. But he's saying kill people that are false prophets. Can you imagine? If we just we say, okay, everybody in Denver that is a false prophet, what we would like you to do, we're going to, just, we're going to take you out. We're going to take you down here. Tennessee's got something they call Sparky. It's a chair. They hook about 5,000 volts to it, and you're going to glow for a little bit. What do you think? How would people react? And why was this such a big deal to God? Put fear in the people. Put fear in the people. Absolutely. Many people from being led astray and back to worship. 
consequence of it is going to have such an impact. Absolutely. So the impact. Keep, go, go, Jared. The, the answer is in the spy for his counsel rebellion against the Lord. I mean, it, if okay. somebody comes in and they get a prophecy right, and you're thinking, man, this guy has got the Lord, but he's saying we need to worship idols, then when you've got your answer, you're going to kill him. Because he, he, you're not going to follow this man. Otherwise, if you were to follow this man, you would go straight away, and within a few generations, you'd be away from the Lord so far, you wouldn't know how to get back here. The word he used was counsel them away. Some of your versions are going to say to induce them. The prophets induced them or uh, counseled them away. What is when you think of the word induced today? What what comes to mind? Labor. Okay, pregnancy. So labor. The actual medically speaking, what you are doing is you are leading somebody to labor. The word itself, D U C E, comes from the word lead. Okay? What is another word that is very close to this? Seduce. Okay, seduce would be definitely very good. What about this one? Educate. Oh, yeah. You see this root? Yeah. Educate would be what? You've got one. This is actually means to lead out. This one is actually to lead in. What's the big significance? Guys, what was going on here was they were falsely educating people, leading them away from God, and then inducing them or leading them in to false part. They were doing two things, ultimately. There was an induction and an education, or education first. Falsely educating, leading them away from God, and then inducing them, leading them in to their false garbage. Here's what nobody asked me, that, that nobody thought about. What is ultimately worse, being separated from God or murder? Separation from God. So should it surprise us that here you've got prophets who are speaking and leading, inducing people away. And God says, you know what you need to do? Take them out of stone. Yes, sir. It's not really that surprising because even like Joshua, when the person took some treasure from Jerusalem, God not only took away his favor from the Israelites, causing some people to die, but when they did find out, they took him, all his stuff, and his entire family and put him in the middle of the field and killed all of them. And, and here's why he's dead on. Look at, at the end of verse 5. So you should put away the evil from your midst. Ultimately, that's, that's what he's getting at right here, guys. He's saying, this, if you allow this, you know, we talked about a little leaven, leaven's a whole, or, yeah, a little leaven, leaven's a whole clump. If you allow just a little bit in, what's it going to do? It's going gonna, it's gonna to infect. It, it would be like if there was a, and I was going to use this class, there was one of you in this class that decided you were going to, no matter what, you were going to teach Calvinism. And so you start one by one pulling your classmates aside, and you start teaching things like pre predestination. What's going to happen to this class if you don't get rid of that? I mean, one by one, if that person is strong enough, logical enough, and can make his arguments, it's going to weaken this, this overall class. And it's going to plant some seeds of doubt, and you may leave this institution, and you may preach a sermon not even knowing what you're saying, that is teaching Calvinism or predestination. So God's saying, get 
them out of there. Take them out. Completely take them out. Because I don't want anybody separating them from me. All right, look down at verse, let's come on down to like verses 7 and 8. Of the gods of the people which are around you, near to you, or far off from you, from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth, you shall not consent to him, or listen to him, or you shall, or, nor shall your eye pity him, nor shall you spare him, or conceal him. What's going on here? In order to get the context, you've got to look at verse 6, where he says, If your brother's son, mother's, your son or your daughter, your wife of your bosom, the friend who is of your own, secretly entices you, saying, Let us go and serve other gods. Then he goes into this, You shall not consent to him, listen to him, shall, I, yeah, shall your eye pity him, nor shall you spare him or conceal him. Don't even want your emotions. Don't want your emotions to turn mercy or feel sorry for him. Because what is he fixing to say? If somebody is trying to lead you to another guy, what, what are you going to have to do to them? Kill them. You're going to have to kill them? Now, in the context of this classroom, how many of us have extended family members who are members of the denomination? Now, think about that in light of this. If you got family members who are enticing you or trying to say, hey, you know, what about this? It says, you shall not consent to him, listen to him, nor shall your eye pity him, nor shall you spare him or conceal him, but you shall surely kill him. Your hand shall be the first against him to put him to death afterward the hand of all people. That's chilling. And it's really chilling given the fact that most of us are related to individuals who are at least promoting or going through the motions of a false doctrine. It's like this fellowship in the Testament. I mean, the same thing should be like a heathen and a vagabond. And that's basically what you have to do with some family members when they should. Yeah, I mean, we, and we don't definitely don't have time to go all the way down this path. I would say, point this out. Before you can disfellowship somebody, you got to be first in what? In fellowship. I'm in talking fellowship. about, like, first my sister, she was born, raised raised in the church, but then after a while she's gone. gone on. So. Yeah. To that, you got to take your sandal off. Um, chapter 14, Improper Morning. Interesting. Means there's a proper way to mourn, there's an improper way to mourn. He expects them to conduct themselves like Christian, well, I say the word Christian, like Israelites. Like his chosen people, even in good times and bad, even when they are going through a rough time. Uh, again, verse 8, well, actually starting in verse 3, he, he's going to go through again what meats they can eat. Verse 8, he mentions again, can eat pork, talks about which birds are proper. He goes to tithing principles which we've talked about in this class already. It wasn't just a strict 10%. Chapter 15, he reminds them your debts are canceled every seven years. At the end of every seven years, you shall grant a release of debts. I bet the Gibbs could probably tell us that they... I don't know how old they are, so I'm going to I'm gonna err on the side of caution. It's probably only been around for 40 or 50 years. Um, <laughs> at least. At least. <laughs> what was the longest amount of time financial institutions wanted to lend you something a long, long time ago? 30 years when I bought my first house. Your first house was 30. Go back a lot earlier than that, like your grandparents. It was more on the lines of 7 to 12. And guess why? It was coming back to this idea right here. After seven years, you release the debt. So whatever's owed you. So as financial institutions were setting up originally, now we're talking 150, 200 years ago, as they were setting up, it was very, very uncommon for people to have a 30-year mortgage or a five-year mortgage or a five-year car note. This is unheard of. You didn't do it. And it kind of comes back to some of this. Look at verse 7. So 
not harden your heart, nor shut your hand from your poor brother, but you shall open your hand wide to him, and willingly lend him sufficient for what is needed, whatever his needs. 7 through verse 10 is talking about how we are to deal with the poor. What is our... How do we deal with the poor today? Okay. That's, and that's an honest answer right there. Yeah, uh, here we have uh, clothing room and food pantry. Okay, clothing room, food pantry. I'm going to say something, and I don't want to take it the wrong way, but I think we have sterilized the way we deal with the poor, especially here in the States. And by that, I mean we almost, it's almost like we have bought, bought off having to deal one-on-one -on -one with the poor. And by that, I mean how many of us in this room, when it comes to thinking about poor, we, we think, well, you know, I get to the church, and the church takes care of X, Y, Z. So we, we, it's kind of like we've taken the responsibility from ourselves to care, and we've dumped it on the institution, and the institution says, okay, here's the parameters that we're going to do this in. And so we've, we've made it very clean and sterile, and even then, sometimes congregations will have policies. Okay, you know, if you come back three times, then we're not going to give you anything, or you know, have whatever you want to say. Um, what's he saying right here? How many of, of us have passed the, the guy holding the sign? We're working for food. And in our mind, we're wrestling with that. Okay, do I give him some money? Do I give him some food? Do I get, what do I do? Is he going to go buy alcohol? What, what do I do? If you're wrestling with it, you better do something. I agree. I totally That's all agree. there is to it, Rick. You're going to be denying what God put inside of you to do. I mean, that's all there is to it. And I have found myself driving <laughs> like a drunk man fighting, you know, this battle going, dang, i got to turn around and just do it, you know? And if we're sitting there battling that, then I guess that's we need to look inside to ourselves and how our own walk is, really. Okay. Is this a poor brother, though? This this just says, if there's, a, uh, if there's among you a poor man of your brethren within any of the gates of your land, so it would be an Israelite. And even that, that, I would say we've sterilized that, don't you yeah. think? Yeah. Mm -hmm. in, all, in all seriousness, guys, do you know anybody in the church today who is going through a financial hard time? I can name you somebody just like that. Because I work with her. Her husband was laid off. And they are now in a position of trying to figure out, okay, are we going to sell our house and take a huge hit or can we even sell the house how, how are we going to live in about three months if something doesn't happen and this is somebody uh, if I if you were to walk into their house it would floor you because the house is huge I mean you're talking six seven hundred thousand dollar house and suddenly they're kind of going we're not going to make it So have we sterilized the way we treat the poor? I think so. James talks very clearly. In fact, you might put in your Bible by Deuteronomy 15. Look at James and his instructions about giving to the poor and his instructions on richness. My, my, my rule of thumb is I try to err on the side of caution. If somebody's hungry, I'm going to throw them some peanut butter and crackers. Big time. Because I got to bow a knee one day and answer God if I just drove right past him and said, "Be you want me to feel." Um, I know a lot of people, and I've, I've held this thought before. We see people and we think all they're going to do is provide a bottle of alcohol. Ultimately, though, who do we have to answer for? Ourselves. Do we have to answer for them? No. Then is Brad ever going to tell you guys that we should? do something we know to be wrong? Absolutely not. We have to be good students. But in those instances where we don't know for sure, 
you know, Law said, if your conscience is, is burning within you, you gotta you gotta think about that. I've thought a lot about that. I mean, what would I be prepared to do, you know, in, in case? And of course, even with me making the decision to come to school, what all am I willing to give up? And how will God just ultimately take care of me? And, and I think Jesus addressed that in Matthew chapter six that He will give you food. He will give you clothing, and he will give you shelter. It may not be a 600,000-square-foot house or, or even a 1,200-square-foot house. It may just be a shelter that you go and you live in that's being provided by the community. Yeah. But he's going to provide it for you. Are we willing to allow ourselves to live? I mean, do we feel like that as Christians we deserve to, to have a two-car garage and a house and two right. vehicles? Or are we going to be content, just like the Christians down in Mexico? You go down to Mexico and see what they live in. It's whatever they got. It's whatever they got. So tie together. Are we satisfied with saying that's what God has provided them? Right. Part of the problem is, guys, today, and I, I, this is something. Hopefully, when I hit my forties, that I'll be able to figure out. In the church today, we are too proud, and we do not know each other well at all. And by that, I mean. We don't know who's hurting, who's suffering, who's poor, who's truly sorrowful, who's rejoicing. And because of that, we don't take care of each other's needs. If Chris Brill, if I lived in Denver and Chris came up to me and said, man, I'm down. I, I need X, Y, Z. I guarantee you he'd have it before he finished the sentence. Because I would want him to have it. That, you know, I've, Hopefully I've got a giving spirit that I would give him above and beyond whatever he asked for. I'm this. I don't know Chris needs X, Y, Z. Because either I don't talk to him, I go in and I sit in my same pew every Sunday, I, I ask the generic, hey, how you doing question, if I says fine, doing fine, just fine, everything's fine, we walk out, and everything isn't fine. And so nobody's actually able to do what the New Testament Christians do, which is take care of each other's needs. That's what I was, you know, when we just start talking about our brothers. Man, I've been so... Swamp with school that I haven't been able to be in tune with people like I was back home. Because God works in the same way back home. When you're in tune with the congregation you're in, you don't, their pride, don't you have to get in the way. You give them money. I mean, you know, you know their need. And that's one of the things I missed. I mean, coming yeah. to school and being out of town, and you know, I'm here in a place, but yet this is just swamp, man. Just, uh, it's been a burden. But the last four years where I've been serving at, you know those things. God puts the, that on your heart when you're in tune with the brothers and sisters around. And that's that too, I think, where elders have to do a better job, too. I think uh, sometimes I've read, you can have one or two people in the congregation that well, it just, it's like the 80-20 rule, you know. Yeah. They, they are just people that are not necessarily needy, but they make poor decisions. Like, I mean, just really bad decision making. I've seen people borrow large sums of money yes. off brethren and the next minute they're coming to the States to go train spotting. I mean, you know what train spotting is? It's Spot. watching trains go by. I mean, honestly, ten thousand, twenty thousand dollars, you know, yeah. borrow that kind of money to get themselves out of debt and then they go on holiday. So I'm just, I know that's a lot to give a person, and maybe it is. And here's, to, here's, how I, fish, here's how I, I, mean, I fish look at that. Than fish, yeah. We we have we all know of, of individuals who abuse the system, undoubtedly. And they can make us afraid of giving them food. Yeah, they, like, they, like they the alcoholic who doesn't. You know. um, in a situation where somebody comes to a church three times in a week and says, "I need free grain." I try very hard to put myself in Jesus' shoes. I know Jesus would never, ever send them away completely at the end. But I also know Jesus would not be a, a poor steward. And he would not ever let them completely pull the wool over his eyes. And so at some point, I think if, if this guy is coming to you under the wrong instance, you know, Hey, I need money again. I, you know, I'm down on my luck, but I'm, you know, realistically, I'm going to go on holiday. I think Jesus would have actually taken, you know, that second time they come to your door and say, "I need more food and money." At some point, He's going to step in and say, "Let's evaluate what's going on in your life, and let's figure out number one, why do you not have any money, and number two, how can we put a stop to this?" And He would probably physically. 
spend time with him doing something to get it corrected. And that's maybe where we mess up, is we don't take that personal step. So that really is that case of getting to know people better? Absolutely. Because if you knew those people, if you knew somebody so well that you know how well they're doing, what their spiritual life is like, what their emotional life is like, and you know either they are down on their luck or they're not, and they're wanting $10,000, if you know them well, it's going to be pretty easy for you to look them in the eye and say, okay, you need $10,000, you know I'm your brother, I want to do what's good for you. What do you need it for? And how can we make sure that things are okay and that you're not going to be right back here in six months? Case in point, I was with an elder this weekend in Missouri, and they were struggling because one of their members had been laid off the preacher kept giving this guy job opportunities. Gave him eight job opportunities. The guy kept saying, no, nah, I don't really think that one's for me. <laughs> he is now 11 months behind on his mortgage at $1,500 a month. He wants the church to pay it. But he is yet to show any inkling of getting a job. First, you got a point, then we got a, then we got a cruise. Well, um, what, what, when you hear of people who grew up in the, uh, in the Depression, what is a common, um, common statement that they'll make? Um, and I've always heard them as I visit with elder, uh, elderly people who grew up in there. We didn't know we were poor. Yeah. We didn't know we were poor. And the reason why, and one lady told me, she says, really, the downfall of this country came when electricity. Or, you know, actually, she said air conditioning, but, you know, when electricity, you know, uh, forced, uh, not forced, but allowed people to go into their inside. homes inside and not sit outside until the house cooled off. And they would visit and they would get to know one another, their neighbors and so forth. Uh, I really think that is something to consider. If you look at the, the architectural structure of houses, from when Chris is talking to today, front porches have disappeared. Garages have increased dramatically. So that now it is a situation where you can physically go into your house, shut a garage door, and never even see your neighbors. All right. Um, moving right along. Deuteronomy 16, Passover is reviewed. The feasts are reviewed. Look at verse 18 in chapter 16. You shall appoint judges and officers in all your gates. Which the Lord your God gives you according to your tribe. They shall judge the people. Um, so here we've got him establishing the fact that we're going to have a system. It's going to be judges. Of course, then they're going to beg for kings. Now this verse 19. As I read verse 19, think about our own government. You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality. Nor take a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. Given the fact that our government is currently being run by the lobbyists, that's an interesting passage. <laughs> Chapter 17. He continues with this train of thought. Look at verse 4. Uh, actually, back up. Let's look at uh, starting verse 2. If there is found among you within any of the gates which the Lord your God gives you, a man or a woman who has been wicked in the sight of the Lord your God and transgressing in his covenant, is gone and served other gods, worship them, either the sun or the moon or any of the host of heaven, which I have not commanded, and it is told of you, and you hear it, then you shall inquire diligently. And if it indeed is true and certain that if such an abomination has been committed in Israel, then you shall bring that person out of the gates and stone them to death. I want you to, to notice where it says, you shall inquire diligently. That is a due process of the law, so to speak. Does that make sense to everybody? They weren't to just assume guilt or assume innocence. They were to inquire diligently to find out what the truth was. Um, verse 6, whoever is deserving of death shall be put to death on the testimony of two or three witnesses. And uh, Mr. Cooper was talking about the fact that they're finally going to put this guy to death tonight who did all the sniping 
which should have happened a long time ago, by the way. But, you know, isn't it interesting, in this country, it takes a pretty big ordeal for somebody to be put to death. That's, that's a pretty big... I don't know if it's still true, but because of the legal costs, I remember reading it actually costs more to kill someone than it does to keep them for life. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we were to just take a person, put them into a put prison for life, and just look, look, throw either way, the costs are ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, it's just absolutely the only guy that's got any sense about him is the guy in Arizona who's he knows what he's doing. If you don't know about him, you need to read about him. He's the one that's making the prisoners stay in tents. They got to work. They got to raise their own food. He's giving them basically mush twice a day, and then they get something else on that third meal. And his, his justification is, if it's good enough for U.S. soldiers, it's good enough for the British. Is that the, the pink jumpsuit guy? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we had mentioned what we give our prisoners today, you know, cable TV, basketball court, yeah. and whatever. They, they've actually said that a lot of these men, once they get out, they want to be back in there. Yeah. You know, they, they'll, they'll come in. They don't have to worry. Back. No, I mean, it's... I mean, think about it, guys. I've got bills every month. I don't know about y'all. Y'all probably don't have any bills. <laughs> every single month, i got bills coming in my mailbox. i got to take care of I've got to report my taxes every single year. All these responsibilities, they don't have to worry about that. I mean, if they don't pay their taxes, they're already in jail. Mm -hmm. On 17, it said inquire diligently. I mean, how would that apply today when someone uh, leaves the church and, and goes and and starts to, you know, fellowship with the denomination or not uh, be uh, you know, going to church at all in any way? And how how would we apply this process to, to that today? I think that's where your elders inquire diligently, meaning talk to them personally. And if it is reported to them, you know, if somebody writes on their Facebook thing, had a great time at Christ's Assembly of God this morning then I think they've got a duty to either call that particular institution or inquire diligently to find out if that's what they're doing. And if so, then they need to obviously first go to that person, take witnesses, put them before the church. Verse 9 sets up a court system, and you shall come to the priests, the Levites, the judge there in those days and inquire of them. They shall pronounce upon you the sentence of judgment. So we've got the beginnings of a formalized court system. Chapter 18, starting in verse 9, it tells them to avoid wicked customs. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire. So again, fire is a Molech. How do you spell that again? M-O-L-E-C-H. Verse 15, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear. Starting verse 15, it's starting to talk about a new prophet. Lots of controversy over who that prophet is. Obviously, one of the options is who? Christ. will raise up for you a prophet, notice capital P, like me from your midst. Him you shall hear. Uh, in fact, if you look down through that particular passage, when it's talking about that prophet, it uses capital letters. Capital P, capital H on E. Chapter 19, three cities of refuge. We've already talked about what those are for. Chapter 19, verse 15, law concerning witnesses. One witness shall not arise against a man concerning any iniquity or any sin that he has committed by the mouth of two or three witnesses. The matter shall be established. Again, we're, he's setting up a very clear pattern for how to be obedient and what happens if folks aren't obedient. Verse 21, he tells them again, don't pity. Your eyes shall not pity. Life shall be for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Christians today, we, we struggle with that. I think realistically, when it comes to punishing a human being, we really struggle with the idea of doing something to someone. And yet he's saying, don't pity them. They've already made their choice. They've already basically determined their own fate by doing these things. Chapter 20. Principles governing warfare. Look at 
look down in verse 8. Actually, all throughout of here, he is giving them um, examples of folks who they can send home. You got a new vineyard? You haven't ever eaten the, the grapes of it? Send them home. Uh, if there's a man who's betrothed to a woman who's, who, and has not married, let him go home. Verse 8, the officer shall speak further to the people, saying, What man is there who is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go home, return to his house. Lest the weak of his brethren faint like his heart. Ironic that weak fighters were basically given a free pass. Why do you think they were given a pass? Want something like that next year in battle. Exactly. If somebody's showing weakness and they're not strong and courageous, I don't want you beside me. Chapter 21, you need to read verses 1 through 5. We're not going to do that right now. But it's the law concerning an unsolved murder. Kind of a, just a, an interesting side note of what they were to do if somebody's found dead and nobody knows who did it. The point there being, and you can write this in your Bible or you can put it in your notes, even though you don't know who did it, you still got to make an atonement for it. You still got to get the people right in the sight of God. God knows who did it. Does God need to have the whole court system or judge? Absolutely not. He knows who killed the person. But the people still need to atone. Um, let's see. When we go into female captives, firstborn inheritance rights, man has two wives, one loved the other. One was loved, the other was unloved. They born him children. Both the loved and the unloved, if the firstborn son is of her who is unloved, then it shall be on the day that he bequeaths his possessions that he must not bestow the firstborn status on the son of the loved one. So here, just basically showing a little how can we be fair. You got two wives, you don't like one, you like the other you don't automatically get to bestow all the good stuff to the children of the one you love. Let's see. Moving down to verse, starting verse 13, we get laws of sexual morality. If a man comes and says, hey, I don't want this woman. What did the parents have to do? If, let me read the exact verse. Uh, if a man takes a wife, goes into her and he detests her. In other words, he just flat out don't like her. He comes out, he charges her with shameful conduct. Brings a bad name on her. Says, I took this woman when I came and I found her. She was not a virgin. What do the parents have to do? They have to show she was. Meaning, she's fought that was laid underneath her during their marriage consummation. If they have that, what happens? The text tells you. Basically, he doesn't get a free pass. Um, if a man is found lying, uh, let me back up. Verse 18, the elders of the city shall take the man and punish him. And they shall find him a hundred shekels of silver and give them to the father of the young woman, because he has brought a bad name on the virgin of Israel, and she shall be his wife. He cannot divorce her all of his days. So if you wake up one morning and you say, Honey, you just don't look good in the morning. I'm going to tell everybody that you weren't a virgin, I'm out of this thing. <laughs> Parents come along and say, uh, Yes, she was. Not only can you not get out of that, you got to pay the dad something. Now, Here's the flip side of this, and we don't talk about this ever in the church. To me, this tells me there is a huge parental responsibility to keep what? Your daughter's Yeah. Guys, think about that for just a moment. Do we even think about that in the church much? Anyway, every once in a while we'll have a, a lesson from the pulpit. But realistically, what he is saying here, this is a parental responsibility to make sure when they present a daughter to a man, 
that she is pure. And oh, how different things would be in the church if men actually took that upon themselves. How far do you take that, though? What if you have a daughter that's 18 and they decide that they want to go on their own? I mean, I mean, lawfully in this country, they have the right to, to do that. And, you know, um, keep the kids in chest. You know. <laughs> Absolutely, they have the right. But is that the smartest thing to do? No, I mean, of course, I'm in that position. I've got a daughter a thousand miles away that's 18 years old. And every night, my wife and I pray that she's making the right choices in her life. But are we doing what we should be doing as parents? Uh, I mean, should we even uh, have allowed her to, to do that? Such a thing. I mean, she's going to a Christian school, but you know. Mm. <laughs> um, let me ask you this, Chris. If we were having this conversation 2,500 years ago, and you asked me that same question, what do you know for sure my answer would be? No. But absolutely not, because he is responsible. To make sure on her wedding day, that when that cloth is laid down, there's going to be blood hidden. Right. He is responsible. Mm-hmm. Now, yes, we're under new covenant. Yes, we have the blood of Jesus Christ cleansing us. But morally speaking, should does that mean we just completely relax everything? I think that's kind of where we are. Mentally, we just, it's kind of like, oh, okay, Jesus is here now. We don't, we, don't, we don't need to worry as much. Now, obviously, I'm not saying we need to go back and we need to start putting claws under our daughters on their wedding night. No. But I do think there's something to be said for parent, parental responsibility of keeping your children pure. God's attitude is not going to change. No. That's, that's, that's when we look at these old laws. The attitude remains the same. The laws change, but... God still thinks the same way. Absolutely. I think once we start that fear of the Lord, uh, it, it brings out a mindset. I remember every time I had an opportunity to be bad in college, I was thinking, man, if God come back right now, I'm going to go to hell. Yeah. You know? And, yeah. and that, that stuck with me and it helped me make those right decisions. And that was something that my parents installed in me. Not only was yeah. it installed by the church. So. Chris, to, to come back to you just because I know you're asking kind of a sincere heart. If I'm in your shoes and I have an 18-year-old, I'm going to be asking myself on a regular basis before she gets that 18th birthday and ready to, to do the separation, is, are, is she and I, are we on the same page about her relationship to God and obedience? To and is she mature enough to keep that obedience to God? And if I have any question in my mind, I'm going to want her in my house or right down the street. Um, and even if I know she's mature and I know she is is of the right frame of mind and knows and respects God and wants to be obedient and wants to be, go to heaven, I'm still going to probably call her every single night. And occasionally I'm going to talk about these very topics. And I'm going to say, I love you so much. I want you to go to heaven are you keeping yourself to that husband that we prayed about when you were a kid? Um, well, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's something that's exactly what we do. I mean, my wife is in contact with her, especially every day, and then I talk to her uh, further yeah. as well. So it's, it's uh, it, what about the age um, um, at that time? I, I, I imagine that at that time it was much younger. Yeah. So you have a little bit more control over a younger Absolutely. Um, and that, not that I could probably call my, my tell my daughter, you, you're finished at the end of this semester, you're coming back up here, and she might say, oh, Dad, I don't want to, this or that, but she would miss, she would do what I told her. Do we have any, and I know this is making you guys get way out of your comfort zone, do we have any scriptural passage that would support our modern day sending our girls away to college. In both Old and New Testament, we find young ladies doing what until what? With their parents. In the home. 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 In the
I just I'm throwing that out just 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 because from you know from a purely 100% lock in kind of perspective. Um, I got a daughter, and let me just go and tell you, it's going to take a man of Moses' statue to have <laughs> knock on the door. Um, <coughs> Chris, we we pray for Claire at night. And we already, she's four years old, we pray for her husband in front of her, with her. You know, thank you, God, for the special person that you have got for Claire. We look forward to meeting him. And she's excited about it. She wants to meet this guy one day. And so when people start entering her life, do you not think I'm going to say, hey, I'm not sure what your intentions are, but I need you to know we've been praying for a spiritual leader for our daughter since she was and I hope that you are that man, will rise up to be that man, so that they understand. And, I, you know, I'm not going to cut any corners. If my daughter says, hey, Dad, I'm, I'm, I think Jared Kyle's the guy, I'm going to take Jared aside and we're going to go fishing or <laughs> go get coffee. Hunting. 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 I don't want to go hunting. <laughs> um, and I, I'm going to be very straightforward, guys, because here's the thing. To me, the most important thing is getting myself and my kids to heaven. And if I think somebody is going to hinder that in any way, you don't even get an option. It just appears in the course. Um, to me, if the person is a good person, i.e., a strong, faithful Christian who is a contender to be with my kids, they're going to feel very comfortable coming up to me and saying, hey, ask me what you want to ask. Let's talk where I am spiritually. And they're going to feel fine if, if, if I say, hey, you know what? I think we need to study a little bit. If they say, eh, you know, I know everything, see. Um, if they want to be with my children, I want to make sure that they are where they need to be. I'm not just going to turn my kids over loose because, folks, I'm doing a job getting them to where they're going to be when I turn them over. I want to, when I walk down the aisle with my daughter, to be smiling going, I know she's in good hands now. Rather than what most husbands do, which is, or most fathers, which is, oh, yeah, I hope this works, you know, and they're teared up. And who gives them away? What mother and father do? I want to be like, yeah, we do. Yeah. Uh, I lost my thought. Okay, sorry. I'm too old for my daughter, so don't even. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to ask you about verse 5 about a woman wearing um, men's clothing and a man wearing woman's clothing. Oh, yeah. Oh, I have that underlined in my Bible, and I, I literally flew by. I got the word metro in my Bible. Meaning <laughs> <laughs> uh, metrosexual. Um, I heard about that last year. Yeah, I know what a New Zealander considers it to be a guy who dresses well. What, what nah, well, it the, can mean that, but I think more of the states is more <laughs> of a more feminine. You, you that your nails polished. Really good to know. That yeah, really you probably know. don't want to describe yourself as metro. <laughs> well, yeah, it's actually a bit of a compliment back in New Zealand. So it used to be back in, in 2004. Yeah, yeah. yeah. now it's yeah. more of those. Guys, I don't know if you've guys. seen the, you guys the, the way people are dressing, especially the guys. There are a lot of guys who are dressing the feminine. Oh. And this right here, a woman shall not wear anything that pertains to a man, nor shall a man put on woman's garments. Do we have cross-dressers today? Absolutely. Oh, yes. This is teaching very specifically that is not <laughs> to be done. I saw one at the school the other day. It scared me. It was, actually, it was two lesbians, and one of them was a pretty little girl, and the other one was a girl guy. And I couldn't tell for, for the first couple of minutes, but then after a minute, they made it start kissing. I said, oh, oh buddy, that's a boy. <laughs> well, no, that's a girl. <laughs> I mean, you want to stop and talk to them and tell them what's right, but you're in the middle of Dollar Tree. And I tell you what's scary is when you, you can't tell. Yeah. We'd have them come into Vanderbilt Emergency Department, and until they put on the gown, you didn't know. <laughs> so you've gone through this whole... Your triage procedure mentally thinking, okay, you got a, uh, a white female, 32, your blood pressure is this, and then they, they disrobe, and, they got, and you're like, whoa, not a white male or a female, this is a white male, you know, you got to go back and reassess things. And anyway. One of my friends got in trouble with the law for 
stepping up to something like that. He, it was a kid cross dressed and he, my friend's rather rough. Oh, he comes up to us and says, get a haircut, buy a pair of jeans, dress like a boy. And the guy started crying and ran to a cop. Um, oh, wow. So, careful what you do about that. Uh, da, da, da. Verse 22, that same chapter. So, Ms. Juanita, to answer your question, again, if more people would heed that today, we wouldn't have the immorality going on. We, got no, we went to a party once, and the guy, a guy dressed up like a lady was well, going around kissing the boys, bringing in, and uh, it really, it really bothered him. And it should, it should. Verse 22, if a man is found lying with a woman, married to a husband, then both of them shall die. So what chapter are we in now? I'm in 22. 22. I am firmly convinced if we would reinstate that particular Old Testament law, adultery would be a different picture than it is today. Amen. If we just went on and said, oops, caught you, you're dead then things would be a lot different than they are today. Uh, interestingly, and I was talking with well, this, was actually trying to quiz my oldest son about this last night. It immediately follows into what you do with adultery. And it's interesting in that <coughs> if adultery takes place in the city, both the adulterer, the man who rapes her, and the woman are both killed. It's done in a field, just the man's guilt. And the rationale that he gives here is, if it's in the city, she could have screamed out. And she'd have been okay. She'd have been safe. If she's out in the field, she probably did try to scream out. Nobody could hear her. Therefore, the man dies, she doesn't. Chapter 23, those excluded from the congregation, meaning, again, God's saying, I want pure, I want a, a separated nation. Uh, verse 4, because they did not be, oh, it's talking about the Moabites and Ammonites. And Ammonite, Moabites shall not enter the assembly of the Lord, even to the tenth generation of his descendants, because they didn't meet you with bread and water on the road when you came out of Egypt, because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Baal, uh, to curse you. Verse. 12, that same chapter. Oh, yeah, verse 12. Somebody read me verses 12 through 13. You shall also have a place outside the camp and go out there, and you shall have a spade among your tools, and it shall be, when you sit down outside, you shall dig with it and shall turn it, turn to cover up your excrement. All right. So we're talking about human waste. What's he tell them to do? Bury it. Bury it. How many of you in here have used an outhouse? <laughs> All right. Did you guys Oh, uh, so, uh, no. Yeah, they did. <laughs> uh, I had four of them back in our Oh, sweet. Okay. <laughs> four holder. Um, <laughs> somebody tell me how the play was transmitted. Dumped it out in the streets of the cities. Yeah. Well, I know in Edinburgh, uh, the way it used to happen was that the, it would start with the poor people who were down at the very bottom of large buildings, and of course the sewer system was just rain. That's what washed away everything, and it would flood down in. So everybody died on the lower levels first, and then it just spread up through the different levels. But it's basically from from uh, fecal remains. Yeah. Yeah. You know what the process is on the plane and those types of diseases? It's usually you got microorganisms that are able to flourish because of waste. Waste is a good, as nasty as it sounds, it's a great breeding ground, uh, nutrient-rich breeding ground for microorganisms. Those microorganisms would infect fleas that were drawn to the waste. Those infected fleas would get onto rats, the rats would then travel back into people's home, allowing those infected fleas to jump off biting people, and that's what actually transmitted the plague. Ironic here that in all the way back before they entered the promised land, he has given them a very specific thing of how to handle human waste, and yet in the Middle Ages, they totally disregarded this, and 12 million people died. 
because they did not bury human waste. Very, very strict rules in the military today regarding this because they even today, if you, let's say we go over to Iraq and we have a lot of human waste on the ground, you're going to have all kinds of sicknesses and problems. And we still have that in India today where they will occasionally, literally just stop and go to potty right on the side of the road. Um, miscellaneous laws. We're in 23. That which has gone from your lips, you shall keep, perform, voluntarily bow to the Lord. Verse 24. When you come into your neighbor's vineyard, you may eat your fill of grapes at your pleasure, but you shall not put any in a container. What's he saying? Don't spill your neighbor's grapes. Don't take anything with you. Store them up. Okay. Take what, what you need, but don't take more. Don't don't get out your Tupperware. If you're hungry, then eat it. Right. Don't go don't go without. Don't go without. Don't take. But don't don't profit or hoard your neighbor's stuff. Notice verse 5 of chapter 24. Everybody in here ought to put a big, huge hat beside this. When a man has taken a new wife, he shall not go out to war, be charged with any business, shall be free at home for a year, and bring happiness to his wife whom he has taken. They got a one-year honeymoon. That's what I'm talking about right there. I got two weeks. Um... I got three days. <laughs> three days. <laughs> three days. Yeah, that's right. I don't know if you're in September. He owes you. Yeah. That's Old Testament, bro. That's <laughs> <laughs> in the book of Ecclesians. <laughs> uh, why? Not not to go too far off on this, but why do you think this was established? To. Get to know each other, one thing. Okay. Children too. Okay. What's usually your first hardest? Uh, what's your hardest year of marriage? First. It's usually the first year when you're trying to blend two different people, two different lifestyles, two different um, ways of doing things, and you're trying to homogenize that into a single functioning family household. This would give you time. To learn each other, to learn likes and dislikes. What we do as it is is we go away for a week or two, we come back, we start our lives back, we're busy, we're busy, and we don't spend the time learning each other the way we should. Crisis come up, financial problems come up, everything hits us, and it's our marriage that then suffers because of that. Yeah, dear. So is this person, these people, not expected to work during marriage? No. They didn't have to do anything. Wow. Yeah. Should not go to war, be charged with any business. You know, if it is smoky and getting blasted, if you did something wrong, that would have been a nice time to live. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 other than that, that um, you know, if you curse your parents, you're going to get stoned. Yeah. And, other than stuff like that. Verse 7, somebody kidnaps somebody, they shall die. There again, you want to learn how we can in, increase the Amber Alert issue. Is going to kill them when we find them kidnapped. We would not have as many kidnappers. Brad, I, I don't think I now know that you support the death penalty. <laughs> I think that's probably fair to say. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, brother, I just support scripture. That's all I do. <laughs> verse 16 Fathers shall not be put to death for their children, nor children. This is verse 16 of chapter 24. Nor shall children be put to death for their fathers. A person shall be put to death for his own sin. You may want to circle that. You may have to preach on that in the future. And that is, no matter what, verse 16, no matter what your parents did or who they were, ultimately you are going to stand before God for what you did. And so, you know, if... I've seen this on both sides of the spectrum. I've seen people who say, well, my daddy was an elder and my granddaddy was a preacher. I'm thinking that's nice and all, but what about you? They're not going to be standing for God for you. Same thing on the other spectrum where people are like, oh, you know, I, I just can't. No. I came out of a, a horrible life. And I'm thinking, okay, 
But it's got to be you that's standing before God, not not all this other stuff that came before you. It's you. Chapter 25. We got the marriage duty of a surviving brother. Again, we get into miscellaneous law starting in verse 11. Notice verse 13. You shall not have a bag differing weights, a heavy and a light. You shall not have them in your house, differing measures, a large and a small. You shall have a perfect and just weight, perfect and just measure. What's he talking about there? Is that a means to buy something or you'd be ripping people off if you had the wrong measure? Absolutely. Every one of you in this room counts on this verse every week and you don't even think about it. And I'll tell you how to put it in context. Next time you go to a gas station, look actually on the pump. There's a sticker. It will be there. You may not have ever seen it. may never look. But it is signed by the state that that pump is giving you what it says it's giving you. It's a standards and weights licensing sticker. They have to go and they physically say, okay, yep, it's really giving you a gallon. Because think about what would happen if Matco or Shell decided we're going to get .9 and sell it as a gallon. Now that doesn't sound like a big deal to you. Until you think about how many <laughs> gallons they sell every day. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, their standards of weight submit, they make some killing money. Or, or they could add water to it. Be, there was a, a gas station, I think it was up in Greeley or someplace like that, years back, that got busted for that. Really? Standards of yeah. They're supposed to check it every single year and be certified every single year. Okay, chapter 26 offerings of first fruits and tithes. He's reminding them that they are a special people to God. Um, He tells them when, notice in chapter 26, verse 3, you shall write, let me back up, verse 2, it shall be on the day when you cross over the Jordan to the land which the Lord has given you, that you shall set up for yourself large stones, whitewash them with wine. You shall write on them all the words of the law, and you have crossed over that they may enter the land which the Lord is giving you, the land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord your God. Therefore it shall be, when you have crossed the Jordan, that on Mount Elba you shall set up these stones, which I command you today, and you shall whitewash them with wine. There you shall build an altar of the Lord your God, an altar of stones. You shall not use an iron tool on them. Build the whole stones, and altar of the Lord, offer a burnt offering onto it, the Lord your God. So, why do you think, again, God is, is asking them to do these particular instances? These are to be what? Reminders. Reminders. I was in chapter 27, reading verses 3 through 6. If you look at verse, starting in about verse 11 of that same chapter, he starts pronouncing curses that's going to happen. Some of these are kind of funny. Um, some of them are not. Cursed is one who treats his father or his mother with contempt. Cursed is one who moves his neighbor's landmark. In other words, if you move a boundary marker, you're in trouble. Uh, Cursed is one who makes the blind man to wander off the road. That's just cold blood in the stair, man. (laughs) Eric, you go left! Cursed is one who lies with his sister. Cursed is one who lies with any kind of animal, etc. Chapter 28, he switches back over. Okay, so I've told you all these cursings. Now I'm going to give you the blessings on obedience. Here's what's going to happen. Chapter 29, the covenant's renewed in Moab. Chapter 30. Chapter 31, the law is to be read every seven years. Verse 12, (laughs) gather the people together, men and women and little ones, and the stranger who is within your gates, that they may hear, and that they may learn to fear the Lord your God, and carefully observe all the words of the law. God here basically says get the whole family together and let them listen to this law 
again, trying to teach that idea of multi-generational faithfulness. Last thing you need to know, Moses obviously dying at the end of this book. Moses to die on Mount Nebo. He gives his final blessings in chapter 33. And then in chapter 34, he dies. You're now ready to cross the Jordan, take over that promised land, take that test, that promised test. Not the same, I realize. Questions, comments, thoughts? Yes. I was actually going to try to let you guys out early, but I figured y'all might want to. You said that uh, when that Moses got people together and he wanted he everybody together, including the little ones. Here, what chapter is that? Thirty-one. Thirty-one. You said visitors as well, didn't you? And anybody in the land, friends in the land. What was that verse in thirty? Chapter thirty. Which one? About the children. Thirty-one. Verse twelve. Okay. Got it. Where was the one about the women's clothes? About, don't put on women's clothes. Yes. <laughs> That's what I've got marked as menstrual or something. Yeah. Uh, 22, 22, verse 5. That's it. All right, guys. It is a pleasure. I'll see you all Thursday. Talking about the law about leading a, a blind man off the road. Yeah. That's really funny because I've got a friend that's blind, and my friends always enjoy watching him and it fails a hay and stuff. He was a good sport, but it just makes me laugh. That is wrong, man. Yeah. Yeah. He's and they all do it, so. That's not good. Yeah, he's good at paintball. Is he? Yeah. We put him in a tree and he, he hits whatever he hears. From sound? Yeah. But I, I think I'd do well again. You know why they put those reflectors on the street, right? What's that? It's rail for blocking the drive. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. It's interesting in Tokyo, I don't know if they've got it in big cities here, but they have um, special concrete uh, pile. They, they, they have a different feel to the feet. And so you can walk along the street and actually feel the difference and know, and then about a metre or two before you get to a stop sign or a, or a crossing over the road, it changes shape and becomes... Uh, that's cool. Yeah, so they can, they can walk all the way around town and they cool. yeah, know where they're going. Are we still recording now? We are no longer...